This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we could now move to the second session, please. Leg the legacy, the view from India and Africa. I'm Sue Onslow, Senior Research Fellow here at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce three, I hesitate to use the word veterans, but three people with unique um, insights and observations from their uh, national context on the legacy of uh, the British Empire. Our first speaker will be Mr. Surendra Nihal Singh, author, journalist, and editor. Um, Mr. Singh is a veteran columnist and journalist who uh, became editor of The Statesman. He is a prolific author, and among his publications are Yogi and the Bear, a study of Indo-Soviet relations, Ink in My Veins, A Life in Journalism, um, and also The Gang and 900 Million, A China Diary. He has a unique worldview on the twilight of the Raj um, as the universe the British had created in India and many other distant parts of the world. Our second speaker will be Dr. Martin Alika, senior presidential advisor, special duties since 2000, former minister of state for foreign affairs of Uganda in the late 90s, and also a former minister of parliamentary affairs in Uganda. Dr. Alika was educated in Uganda um, before coming here to Britain where he studied at Birmingham University. Um, he had a Fulbright scholarship. He th also was recruited into the Ugandan civil service as a dental officer and worked in government until 1960 before going into private practice in Kampala. Between 1972 and 1996, he was in exile in Nairobi, but from 1990, he had accepted work for the president of Uganda as a special advisor and emissary. So, um, a combination then of, uh, it could be said, opinion former as a journalist and a senior policy practitioner. We're also very pleased to welcome um, our third speaker, who is Mr. Simon Zukas. Mr. Zukas <coughs> stepped in at very short notice to replace Mr. Mark Chona, and so we're particularly pleased to welcome him here today. Uh, Mr. Zukas uh, was educated um, in Southern Rhodesia and University of Cape Town often referred to in Zambia as a veteran politician and freedom fighter. He had the, uh, I suppose, unfortunate experience of being deported by the colonial office from northern Rhodesia to Britain in 1952, while secretary of the Anti-Federation Action Committee. He returned, um, was awarded OCF by the first government after independence. He was a founder member of the movement for multi-party democracy in Zambia in 1990, and was elected MP and served as a deputy minister in State House by President Chiluba. Uh, so without more ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Surendra Nihal Singh to speak on his observations from India. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, for kind words. Uh, I'm going to make a written presentation for the simple reason that I think I should stay within the time limit and give a greater opportunity to uh, a very interesting audience time to ask questions and so that we can interact a little more, I think. Uh, as a boy of 10 in Banaras, now Varanasi, I was taken to a mass gathering, which through the mist of time, I recall, was the mesmerizing presence of one man, bare-chested with a skimpy, shining white dhoti with a pocket watch dangling from the waist. He had a spellbinding effect on the gathering. That man, of course, was Mohandas Gandhi. And my initiation into Indian nationalism never looked back since then. As a teenager, I devoured Gandhi's ex experiments with truth, Jawaharlal Nehru's discovery of India, and his autobiography, and was moved by the folklore of the independence movement as it grew with landmark events, some of them violent and ugly, <clears throat> that dotted the decades as World War II began and ended. And it became clear that independence was within touching distance. On 15th August 1947, freedom famously came at midnight to 
the partition India of old. Against this background, it is perhaps strange that I never gave a thought to the seeming inappropriateness of opting for majoring in English literature for my graduation studies. I had immersed myself in Shakespeare, Milton, Keats, and Shelley, and Jane Austen for so long and so pleasurably that I found no contradiction between my patriotism that I often wore on my sleeve and my deep love for English literature. At school in Banaras, I was brought up on Hindi, but after those early years, I went to Ahmedabad, where my father had taken up the principalship of a college. The only option for a non-Gujarati-speaking boy was a desert school. I went to St. Xavier's and was weaned on English and the loving care of Jesuit fathers and brothers. My Hindi, apart from the spoken language, came to be neglected. I went to English all the way to the university in Delhi and beyond. Looking back, I find it intriguing how tied up my life was with Britain and its way of life. My father, Gomukh Nihal Singh, an academic before he briefly dipped his feet in political waters, did his MSc in economics in London before reading for the bar at the, in a temple, that latter to he, please his father. He never practiced. It was uh, his fond hope that I would obtain a scholarship to Oxbridge after completing my studies at Delhi University, although I sailed through English literature without much effort. My interest in what, would, uh, what went under the wider rubric of extracurricular activities uh, kept me from attaining distinction. At a later stage, I became actively interested in amateur theatricals uh, and was an enthusiastic uh, actor portraying characters ranging from Alex and T.S. Eliot's The Cocktail Party to the leading character in Alexander Ostrovsky, The Diary of a Scoundrel, the UK High Commission, the Beit Dramat Dramatic Society, was an inspiration in the cultural milieu in Delhi of those days. It was not until I was 28 that I made my first visit to London on my way back from the United States, where I had gone on a four and a half month fellowship. I was duly impressed by the bowler hats and folded umbrellas that abounded. I thought that they were mere props to fictional characters, the delightful P.G. Woodhouse and other novelists conjured up. I had been recruited as a humble staff reporter in the Delhi edition of Statesman, British-owned newspaper in 1954. At the time, both the news editor, Philip Crossland, and the resident editor, Evan Charlton, the latter to distinguish himself in the British Broadcasting Corporation, where Britain, the editor, Ian Johnson, was in his perch in Calcutta, now called Qatar, the newspaper's head office. It was a pleasurable feeling to assume the editorship of the statesman in 1975 in Calcutta in the midst of the Indian emergency, which we fought as best we could. The British uh, owners had left the show, left for home show years earlier. Looking back at the legacy of the empire at the ripe age of 84, what do my recollections in tranquility lead me to. My journalistic travels to the former French and French ruled in the China states and the once Dutch ruled Indonesia in the 1960s provided the foil to look at the impact of British rule on me and my generation. It was, it struck me how the French had got under the skin of the people at any rate the rich and powerful in the middle class they had ruled over. <clears throat> in Phnom Penh, in a mid-morning interview with Prince Norodom Sihanouk, 
I will serve champagne by a white-gloved waiter and copies of Paris March were strewn, were strewn on our side table. Later, visiting him in a self-imposed exile in Beijing uh, in the late 1970s, Prince Sihanou treated me to a continental lunch prepared by a Chinese chef substituting Coca-Cola for red wine, although supplies of white wine and champagne had not run out. In the Saigon of those days, at the beginning of the American military intervention, old-timers spoke with deep regret over the barbarity of delicate sauce being replaced by tomato ketchup with steaks to cater to the taste of US troops. The Cirque Sportif was still alive, and French hostesses drilled young American guests in French table etiquette. In the mountains of Xiangkhuang, the home of the Patit Lao in Laos, the so-called Red Prince Sufanuong, I found, was offended, if not addressed as Volt Altes. In Jakarta, visiting the independence hero Mohammed Hatta and his home, I found the nearest thing to a Dutch squire. He had spent time in the Netherlands and had acquired many of the attributes of the upper class Dutch. I, I was further, I was familiar with Dutch moors because having married a Dutch woman from Amsterdam. Hatta had been put to grass by Sukarno, whose fondness for women transcended nationalities. <laughs> for the rest, Indonesians seemed to have got over the legacy of Dutch rule remarkably quickly, while the Dutch ex adapted an elaborate meal from the Padang region of Sumatra to call it Re Stafo, a lavish bread of many varieties of rice with small portions of some 40 dishes, a treat reserved for Sundays, following, followed by a long siesta. My interaction with the brilliantly nimble-minded Subandrio, the then foreign minister, who met an unfortunate end, was notable for his outburst that he would rather forgive himself for being ruled by us. He would never forgive himself for being ruled by a small country like Holland. The size of the colonial powers, the ruler's home, he, he implied, was even more insulting than being ruled by the outside power. Compared with the impact of British rule on India, the French had influenced the upper middle classes most in their social and food uh, and drinking habits. So it was in India, it's in terms of the urban Indian's fondness for Scotch whiskey, or its less expensive Indian variant. In reverse, chicken tikka basala is something of a national British dish. But apart from the game of cricket that had been enthusiastically embraced by all sections of society, the actor Amir Khan recently uh, taking it to the masses through the film depiction. Britain has influenced India in, a, in deeper ways at the intellectual level, although the intention of some British administration, administrators was to educate Indians, to provide an army of babus. Modern British firms in Calcutta, the old imperial capital of British India, still swear by the proficiency of their babus in the attention they pay to detail in the elaborate script. And it comes about that in Madras, now Chennai, you can find a man sporting a Western jacket over a dhoti, displaying caste marks on his forehead, deeply immersed in the subtleties of British jurisprudence. Indeed, India's independence generation was deeply influenced by British thought and Moors at the intellectual level. Jawaharlal Nehru gave an eloquent uh, testimony in his writings and uh, much and such giants as 
Baba Sahib Ambedkar had enriched the aspects of British, enriched uh, uh, test, sorry, enriched aspects of British jurisprudence in the new Indian constitution he helped frame. It is surely a test to British legacy that the land of many languages in the first flush of independence, several of the Indian states had downgraded the teaching of English in schools and colleges in favor of regional languages and Hindi. It did not take them long to, re to realize that they were harming the, level, the lives of their students by denying them proficiency in the virtual international lingua franca and a source of modern learning in science and technology. It can, of course, be argued that having experienced waves of invaders and their depredations, as well as the new ideas they brought over the centuries, Indians uh, learned to be harmonizers and uh, synthesizers. The interactions between the Mughals and the Hindus for instance, gave rise to a composite culture, which is an object of attack by uh, sections of the Hindu political uh, right today. And British rulers, I would argue, achieved what no other colonial ruler had influenced generations of Indians in the virtues of British thought and laws and love for its rich literature. The British sense of justice inspired many of India's independent figures is no secret. But so were other colonial peoples inspired by the tenets of other metropolitan powers like the French. What was then unique about the interruption, about the interaction of the British and the Indian subjects? Was it the message of the Mahatma, his proclaimed theme that his countrymen should hate the British Empire, not the British? Was it an inherent affinity between the traditional empire builders of recent centuries and uh, an ancient civilization that had learned to assimilate new thinking to evolve a composite culture even while spreading its own ancient learning and mores? across Asia. Buddhism's march from India to Southeast and East Asia <coughs> remains a fact of history. The, the caste mark daubed forehead of the famous Brahmin Tamilian and his mastery over the subtleties of British legal and political thought must enshrine the quintessential nature of how deeply Britain has influenced India. Colonial rule is an oddity today, but Britons can feel a measure of pride in how deeply they have shaped the people of a subcontinent in their intellectual thinking <coughs> in the modern age. The British did not always live up to the entire, uh, did not live up to the values they professed, as is evident from the history of the rel relatively long period of British rule in India. But these were, but there was still often subtly and in an undertone the propaganda, the propagation of such values as fair play and the rule of law. The world's thinking progresses, after all, slavery was very much part of the life of today's developed countries, and racial discrimination is still a feature of everyday life in most countries. It will forever remain a matter of dispute whether delaying the date of independence of the two new nation states for a few months and the manner in which the demarcation was accomplished and announced had not tempted fate but such questions had best be left to historians. Of greater relevance today is to reflect on how the ruler and the rule influence each other 
beyond scotch whiskey and chicken tikka masala, there can be little doubt about the depth of British influence on India and the subcontinent. Britain's joining the European Economic Community, which later morphed into the European Union, was <coughs> for many Commonwealth countries, including India, a transforming moment. But the pulls of the Commonwealth are still tugging at British heartstrings, as is evident from the current debate on the virtues of being in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, to Mr. Surendra Nihal Singh for emphasizing the intellectual and cultural legacies of empire that uh, Professor Aye had um, alluded to in, in his um, address. If I could now ask, please, Dr. Martin Alika. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, legacy of the empire, I am going to make mine simple by using Uganda as a case study. The state of Uganda was created by the British after the Berlin Conference of 1884, which carved up Africa to be ruled by the Western nations. The first British people to arrive in Uganda were the missionaries who were invited by the Kabaka of Buganda, an invitation the Buganda have since regretted. <laughs> the British found a simple but organized form of government in the kingdom, four kingdoms in Uganda. This enabled the, Brit enabled the British to establish the system of indirect rule in Uganda the system was extended throughout Uganda, including areas which had no single ruler. Thus, in the case of my father, as a ward, his administration collected two taxes, one for the colonial government and the second for his own administration. He had four levels of chiefs below him. He had his own courts, police force, prison service, and all customary laws were administered by chiefs, and their courts dealt with cases such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, land, ownership, etc. The British concerned themselves with serious crimes such as theft, robberies, and homicide. From time to time, a British administrator would visit the chiefs to check on the cases that the chief had presided over to make sure that justice was done. This is how I, as a little boy, first met colonial civil servants, that is, as visitors and not as rulers. Because Uganda was a protectorate, the British did not invest personal money in the country. Three types of British people came to Uganda, that is, the Catholic and Anglican missionaries, civil servants and business people, like bankers and traders. One very interesting statistic tells us a lot about how the British wanted to rule Uganda. In 1961, the last British staff list was printed and all of the officers in the administration were Oxbridge, except 12, including the governor, Sir Walter Coots, from St. Andrews University. The professionals were graduates of universities from all over the United Kingdom, which this means that the quality of the British personnel in Uganda was exceptional. There were officially no uneducated foreigners in Uganda, as was the case in Kenya, Congo, not to mention South Africa. Uganda was spared white settlement and colonization with all its injustices. In 1922, the British passed two very interesting laws. The first forbade the sale of land to non-Ugandans, especially to foreigners, which meant British people. But a foreigner could lease the land for 49 to or 99 years. 
The second law stipulated that Kampala shall be developed as a multiracial town. The missionaries established and ran their schools and a few hospitals. These schools laid the foundation of excellence for our education system. In 1962, after independence, the government took over completely the administration of the former missionary-run schools. In most schools, this brought about a decline in standards in the areas of academics and discipline. A few of the schools established by the missionaries with strong religious foundation remain best to this day. The system of administration which the British established in Uganda worked because it enabled those involved in government to follow the rules. The chain of communication was well laid down and enforced. This minimized and in most cases eliminated the temptation for corrupt actions. In the local gov government, authority began with the head of the village up through four levels to county chief. In the case of the four kingdoms, there was the fifth level of authority, the king. In the British colonial administration, the ranking was from the lowest administrative officer, who was a district officer, up to assistant district commissioner, district commissioner, provincial commissioner, and if he was lucky, chief secretary, and finally the governor. Everybody in the chain of command knew and exercised what was expected of them. In the year 1951, marked the beginning of modern political development in Uganda. Governor Sir Andrew Cohen arrived in Uganda with a very clear agenda, that is to prepare Uganda for self-rule. This put him on collision course with the British colonial civil servants who did not want to lose their jobs on the one hand, and on the other hand, the Ugandan rulers who did not want to be ruled by commoners. <laughs> Nevertheless, Sir Andrew Cohen pursued his goal. One of his actions was to sign an executive order stating, quote, equal pay for equal work. Prior to this, there were three scales of salaries, British, Asian, and Ugandan. Cohen also released extensive funds from the government budget for overseas university education. Hitherto, Ugandans could only be promoted to posts of assistance to British officers because they did not have the necessary degrees to be full officers. They were classified as assistant medical, assistant agricultural, assistant veterinary officers, etc. During Cohen's time, Ugandans were invited to government house as guests and not as servants serving foreigners. Some British civil servants boycotted these parties, but there was no turning back. No other, no governor, no other governor did one-tenth of what Cohen did in the five years he was governor. Cohen had one advantage over most British civil servants, his superior intellect. He was feared not because he was governor, but because of his superior intellect. As independent approached, the colonial governor now under Governor Sir Walter Coutts allocated substantial funds for scholarships for Ugandans to study in the UK. The plan was, for every British professional in government service, a Uganda was sent to the UK to study in order to replace the expatriate. By 1965, we had over 5,000 students in universities, hospitals, colleges in this country. A Central Scholarships Committee was established to oversee the award and monitoring of these scholarships. I had the honor of being appointed the chairman of this committee, and to this day, it was my greatest contribution to the development of my country. In 1962, there were six million Ugandans and one university, Makerere. 
Today, there are 34 million of us and 34 universities. Of these universities, less than 10 teach science subjects or professional courses requiring science subjects. The majority of them offer degrees in such areas as business administration, commerce, environmental studies, developmental studies. Many courses have been introduced in these universities which would best be taught in colleges that award diplomas. In schools, science, mathematics, and now information technology standards have remained relatively high. But the English language has suffered. English is now being taught by third generation non-native English speakers. As a result, those of us who were taught English by native English speaking teachers are appalled at the poor standards of English spoken by university graduates. On January 25th, 1971, Ugandans woke up to the shocking news of a coup. Idi Amin had taken over the government and plunged the new nation into death and destruction. Amin and his uneducated tribesmen and Muslim supporters killed many Ugandans, educated Ugandans, for very simple and minor reasons. Worst of all, Amin destroyed the system of administration which the British had left behind. To this day, the system has not been fully restored. Under Amin, district officers were replaced by primary school leavers turned army officers. The governor of Kampala before the coup was a car washer. He joined the army and in three years became a colonel. He ruled Kampala as his personal property. In eight years, Amin had reduced Uganda to a level below which it could not go further. The expulsion of Asians and expatriates was just one of the many evils of Amin. It is estimated that 300,000 Ugandans were killed during Amin's regime. Idi Amin strengthened Christianity in Uganda. By waging a religious war against Christians, he united them. Today, there are no foreign missionaries as such, but the church has never been stronger. New churches are being built all over the country. While the Catholics and Anglican followers are on the increase, so are the Pentecostals. The tragedy of the Pentecostals is that while some of their pastors are well educated and know and understand the Bible, the majority of them are self-appointed and of low educational level. They become preacher pastors for financial gain and this has become a very lucrative profession. What is the school report Uganda brings home after 50 years of independence? I was there when the Duke of Kent presented the instruments of power to the Prime Minister Milton Obote on October the 9th, 1962. 50 years later, the Duke and I met in a totally different Uganda. Since independence, considerable progress has been made in several areas. As previously mentioned, we have a population of 34 million. The people in Uganda are better fed and better dressed and have access to better means of communication and transport, and for many, generally, a decent lifestyle. There is free primary education, thus enabling disadvantaged children to go to school. While the school population of all levels has greatly increased, there are many unemployed university graduates as the economy of the country has not sufficiently expanded to accommodate the large number from the universities. Tremendous progress has been made in trade and business with Ugandans control, contra, controlling most of these. One of the greatest areas of progress and achievement has been in the empowerment of the women. Women are holding important posts in universities, business, and in government. Uganda has several women holding cabinet posts in addition to high court judges. 
one third of members of parliament are women, and notably the speaker of this parliament is a woman. This empowerment has occurred over the last 25 years. There has been a boom in private housing and development, both commercial and residential. On the downside, there is a shortage of drugs in hospitals, heavy traffic jams in the, in the rush hour, and potholes on the roads. The current parliament has 374 members who have demanded and are paid unrealistically high salaries and allowances. The government includes several ineffective ministers, a, a, polit a politicized civil service with massive corruption and theft. Those with, with no connection are jailed, while those who are well connected are not. One Ugandan judge, when retiring, had this to say. He, he had one regret, that he only tried tilapia, a small lake fish, and was never given a crocodile to try. <laughs> The British taught us many English words, but the one word they forgot to teach us was the word maintenance. <laughs> Several of the once beautifully maintained schools, hospitals, and roads are now a shadow of what we inherited. There is no more passenger railway service in the country. The Kampala-Nairobi line is operational for goods only, and even that can be risky. After 50 years of independence, we have not renamed any town or roads. British names, Victoria, Albert, Edward, George, remain the names of our lakes. Our roads are still Lugard, Prince Charles, Elizabeth Avenue, etc. You cannot rewrite history. Uganda is one of the former British colonies where the British system of education remains unchanged. The judicial system remains mostly British. Uganda is one of the countries of the world where there is relative freedom of speech and press. The press has, has taken full advantage of this. Some newspapers print irresponsibly. Ugandan type tabloids would be would not be tolerated in most countries. Quite often, Ugandans have taken freedom of assembly and speech for granted, forgetting that any freedom comes with responsibility. For example, the opposition demands to hold their political rallies in the center of Kampala, thus disrupting the business of people who have nothing to do with politics. To their credit, the British handed over the governing of Uganda to Ugandans smoothly and in a very dignified manner. There was no destruction of medicines and drugs, public utilities or communication systems as occurred when some European colonial powers left their colonies. There is no record of a single Ugandan killed by the British for agitating for independence. The truth is, there was a large section of Ugandans who did not want independence for fear of being ruled by commoners as it is the case today. <laughs> Finally, I would like to add that while Uganda may be independent, our women still copy the dress fashion from the UK even though the anatomy of the two species are markedly <laughs> different. Dr. Alika, thank you very much indeed for that balance sheet. Um, if I could call on now, please, uh, Mr. Simon Zukas to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to bring you back 
to the question of race. Uh, because as far as Zambia is concerned and the whole of Southern Africa, uh, you, ca you cannot understand the situation with, without uh, looking at race. But there is a positive side that I want to refer to. We have today a, a Zambian oddity. We have a, a white vice president in a territory where there are only about 30,000 whites and um, a population of some 13 million African people. Now, this is of significance because uh, these days, xenophobia, religious rivalries, tribal or ethnic rivalries are, are key factors. And yet, we have managed to achieve this. This is a credit. The question is, to whom is, it a, is this credit? I would say that, to some extent, it is a credit to the colonial past in, in Zambia, but only to a very small extent. I think the cre credit goes to the Zambian people and also to some whites who took pro-African positions against colonial policies. And I think we cannot ignore the racial factor in, in the history of, of Zambia uh, or of Zimbabwe. Now, if goodwill exists today in Zambia towards the past connection with Britain, this is a result of the work done in the rural areas, in the hinterland, not on the line of rail, by many white colonial servants, and even during the Federation, which many of them abhorred and had no hand in its imposition. Much of this goodwill, however, results from change in colonial policy from late 1960 onwards, when the strength of African nationalism was beginning to be accepted by the colonial power. Now, the big question that we're asking ourselves is, did this change have to wait for 1960? Was there no possibility of promoting Africans in the provincial, uh, provincial administration before that? Well, because even during the Federation, the, uh, there was the territorial sphere where the colonial office had freedom to act. And on-the-job training could have been given to many Africans. There was no need to wait for the Moncton Commission verdict of African total opposition to Federation. Clearly, it needed a major political change at British government level. And this was revealed in the Macmillan speech in 1960. Only when it became clear that Africans were soon to take over would training start. And the purpose was obviously to get a smooth transition. Now, I have some 75 years in what is known as Zambia. I will outline a balanced assessment of the legacy of empire for our country. 
I see the colonial connection broadly in three phases. From 1924, after World War II, after Macmillan's Wind of Change speech of 1960, and the period of 20 years in between these two. That is the period between World War II and 1960. Now, instead of going chronologically to, uh, back to 1924, I, let me start with the period after 1960, after late 1960. That, were, that phase can be seen to contribute to a legacy worthy of consideration. In the absence of black administrators, in the local uh, provincial service, the administration went searching for black <coughs> candidates to train up. A search for graduates took place at the University of Salisbury, and uh, some were recruited, and later some were even sent to, uh, to Cambridge for further study. By 1962, a number of blacks were appointed as cadet district officers. And after a period, but only after a period of on-the-job training. Now, in the colonial service, black self-rule was no longer seen in terms of the old saying of Sir Godfrey Huggins, a hundred, two hundred years. So it, it suddenly became round the corner. Now, I can um, add something to a previous speaker that I was given in 1945, pre-Andrew Cohen, I was given the same answer in ginger by a provincial commissioner when I asked him how soon would Uganda be brought to self-rule and he went like this, 100, 200 years. <laughs> so that phase was behind us. Preparation towards training uh, for self-rule was not only confined to the rural areas at district officer level. It went ahead in Zambia at various other levels. Now, the only level where I think radical change was not taking place and where Af Africans were not being introduced was in the police special branch. And this, very soon after independence, resulted in a mass dismissal of some 29 officers. Now, I cannot give you direct ex experience um, to the introduction of the district officers, but the, um, the man I'm replacing here in speaking uh, I can quote him. He says, I worked with some really good people for whom I have the highest respect. Now, in the rural areas, foundations were laid for, local, for, uh, for a local judicial system, starting with local courts at chief's level, including appeal courts manned by selected chiefs in each district. The old native treasuries were expanded to district native authorities with responsibilities for revenue collection and expenditure for local projects. Now, all this ca came after late, uh, after late 1960. But this, this was going on in, in the hinterland. Now, 
What was happening along the line of rail or in the towns? Let me go back to the earlier period from 1924 to World War II. Development was at a very low level. Um, there were some schools, uh, rural schools built, some clinics, but generally speaking, there was not much to think about. Uh, Africans could only do menial jobs on the mines or on the railways, or be re recruited into the Northern Rhodesian Regiment, uh, or as constables in the police force. Um, I want to concentrate on the period for, uh, and, uh, now from World War II to the late 1960s. The colonial administration in, Zamb in North Rhodesia always pandered to the mine owners, especially during World War II. Between the war and 1960, the pandering was extended to the growing political strength of the white settler minority. And I'll give you a few glaring examples. In 1949, an agreement was made between the Northern Rhodesian colonial government and white employers on a maximum wage for African laborers, on a maximum wage for African laborers in Lusaka of 45 sh shillings per month, with the starting wage not to exceed 22 and 6 per month. Now, we could dwell uh, on the amount and try and translate what it means in today's terms, but I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to draw attention to the capping. I mean, these negotiators were way ahead of the current dialogue about capping bankers' bonuses. I'll give you another example. The Northern Rhodesian government at the time accepted uh, apartheid uh, practices in the shops in, in the towns. Africans could not enter to buy anything through the front door, but had to be served through windows at the rear. And this didn't merely apply to the private sector. Even in Her Majesty's post offices, there was a special counter reserved for serving Africans. Anyone who tried to uh, ignore that by going to the ordinary counter would, would be told where to, to go in no uncertain terms. But the one uh, example that I find very important is where a friend of mine, Thomas Fox Pitt, uh, MBE, who had been in the service, provincial service in, in Northern Rhodesia for some 27 years, tried to uh, uh, get to, Africans to grow Virginia tobacco, which required flu curing. And this was opposed by the white farmers. This was happening in the eastern province. Instead of being backed by the governor, uh, Fox Pit was forced to take early retirement and became an opponent of federation. Now, in my accounting, Fox Pitt <coughs> goes on the credit side of their legacy, but the governor does not.
Attempts by black mine workers at forming trade unions were blocked before and during the war years. And it was only when labor came in after the war that uh, trade unions were made legal, uh, African trade unions were made legal. In contrast to this, the BSA company, the British South Africa company, went unchallenged by the colonial office in receiving royalties on exported copper while making no contribution to mining whatsoever. Then, to cap all this, there was the imposition of federation in 1953 in the face of almost 100% African opposition. So, um, if we look back, the real change that uh, we could see in positive terms comes after, after 1960. And then, in the face of growing militancy of African nationalism, the North Rhodesian government stopped pandering to white political power and rushed to prepare the country for black self-rule and independence. I can quote uh, Mark Chona here uh, as f having direct experience of the process. The British colonial service, managed largely by professionals, played a very crucial role in ensuring orderly preparation for handover of power at independence. <laughs> My own taking over, that's his, from Paul Thirks, was very smooth. And at independence, the colonial authority handed over to us a, a going judiciary and a respect for the rule of law, a well-structured civil service, a democratic constitution, and even the accumulated sterling balances uh, of Northern Rhodesia. And they left us with something very useful, which is the English as the official language. There was an attempt to hand over to us something else, and that was the obligation to pay royalties to the British South Africa Company for doing nothing. We managed to block this, not with the help of any colonial civil servant, but with our own um, hired consultants. Now, I would join Mark Chona in giving praise to many colonial officers doing their bit on the ground in the rural areas before and after independence, and to those in Lusaka planning the orderly handover of power. But my praise would not go to the period, the pandering period, when um, decisions were taken not in the African interest, despite the pro uh, proclaimed role of the British uh, government. The imposition of uh, federation and even the recommendation of it was done by colonial office officials, colonial officials. And yes, it, it was not approved by many district officers, including someone sitting 
in frontier on the ground. But nevertheless, their disapproval was silent. The, the process was allowed to go on. And of course, it was a folly, a folly that many of us opposed, uh, many of us um, saw would, uh, would uh, not last long. In, in my own case, I am on record as saying it wouldn't last for more than 10 years, and I was out by one year. However, when, when the, the role of the colonial system became terminal in Zambia, the authorities did better in preparing us for self-rule than did the Belgians to, in the territories to the north of us, where instability, patricide, patricidal strife, and political interference by the mining companies characterized the handover of power. Thank you. Thank you very much to Simon Zukas for that contrasting um, presentation of timing and modes of departure um, I, uh, from um, Zambia. We have now uh, approximately 22, approximately 22 minutes for a question and answer session. So if I could call on questions from the floor, please. Yes, question here, please, Rob. If you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, Ranjiv Gunawardner. Um, my question is, uh, the, well, the empire as it stands, it wasn't a benevolent operation, it was a commercial operation. Jamaica was a sugar bowl, Ceylon or Sri Lanka was the tea bowl. So in relation to what's been said, uh, they focused upon commercial activity. If you compare the other um, empires, like the Portuguese or the Dutch, they actually, or the, uh, the Spanish, they try to convert a lot of people into their religion. But could you kindly enlighten me if the British Empire also tried to convert people into Christianity as part of their policy in relation to like, the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese? Thank you. Is that a question directed to each member? Of the um, anyone who's able to answer that question would be greatly appreciated. Well, I, I thought the whole idea of the East India Company was commercial. I mean, that's how it all began, didn't it? Uh, so there was no secret about uh, their commercial enterprise. As far as uh, conversion is concerned, conversion to Christianity, I think that varied uh, depending upon the enthusiasm of uh, particular rulers and the uh, Jesuits, for instance, and other priests and uh, their anxiety to, uh, to bring uh, religion or blessing of religion, as they put it, uh, to uh, a people or peoples. So uh, I, I don't think there's any, any doubt about the commercial nature of how it started. Uh, other things took on a role of their own in later years or centuries, but uh, it was a commercial enterprise to begin with. Dr. Elika, do you want to I think in, in Africa, religion and colonialism went hand in hand. The uh, missionaries came uh, to uh, teach the pagans the new, the new religion, and uh, at the same time, uh, the colonial powers ruled the country. That's why Kenyatta said, while we covered our eyes in prayer, they stole our land. <laughs> in North Rhodesia, there was only one objective, and that was um, to extract uh, copper. Religion was left to itself. Um, sadly, it was after independence that uh, government started 
interfering with the religious a aspect by declare, declaring Zambia as a Christian nation. And th this uh, uh, persists. And there was no need for it. The uh, Christian churches were in the majority. But uh, there was an element of Muslim penetration. So the Chaluba government quickly declared Zambia a Christian nation. And since then, various attempts to change the constitution have included this aspect. Thank you. Um, question here, please. I'm going to there. If I may take two questions, I think this would... Nicholas Barrington, former diplomat. When I first went to Pakistan, I expected to be resented deeply as a representative of former colonial power. And I found I was, people respected me and said, we admired you. Your people who were there, who were here, were, um, understood the country, spoke the languages, um, and were honest. Uh, some of them were arrogant, but were honest. Incidentally, the missionaries in, that I, we met in Pakistan hardly converted anyone. They were respected for, for what they were doing in, in schools and in hospitals uh, and for, for their, for their, for, for, as individuals. I think corruption was actually crucial. I found that people looked, the older generation looked back at the British people as not being corrupt, not putting money in their own pockets. That was the civil servants and the generals and the missionaries. I'm not sure whether that applies to Africa or not. I don't Africa so well, but it seems to me corruption is absolutely a crucial question now over the whole of the third world because it is so rampant and it's not only affects, of course, the economy, but affects people's uh, loss of faith in government. If they feel that they can't get what they want uh, except through corruption, then they lose faith in government and this creates all sorts of problems in government. Thank you very much. I could take another question. I'm Charles Hartley. Um, uh, I had um, 35 years in Malaysia. I, I feel we haven't covered Southeast Asia very much. Uh, thank you for the cover of India and a great deal from Africa. Can I give a little bit of uh, ideas about Malaysia? Uh, I started life there as a planter uh, just before independence and uh, I saw out my whole career there, um, working uh, subsequently for the State Economic Development Corporation. Now, um, Malaysia suffered greatly from the war, of course, and uh, everything was smashed to a terrible degree, uh, and the people were starving. Uh, when I came in 57, we were just recovering from it, really, but um, uh, money was not really available for, uh, for, for rebuilding it to any great extent, particularly because we had insurrection from the Chinese, basically, communist movement. Um, and who wanted to get uh, a Chinese uh, a communist government in to replace what they considered the colonial government? Malaysia, uh, Malaya was a federation uh, and ruled uh, largely in most states uh, through the Sultan. And there was a degree of, uh, uh, of, of um, grassroots uh, uh, rule uh, through local legislation in each state. Uh, uh, the subsequent to uh, independence, uh, this was eroded and we went much more towards almost a presidential ruling. But they, they, that, that uh, ha, the country has expanded wonderfully since, uh, si since uh, independence and is a, a modern country. Uh, but unfortunately, there is an element of corruption which is holding things back. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Can, uh, yes, please. Uh, I think I can speak for East Africa that the British in East Africa were not corrupt. 
it was because the system that they laid down for payments, for example, was so specific and in such a way that <clears throat> no one person could make any payment without authorization from at least two or three other people. And also, when a British uh, officer was caught, he was not spared. He was taken to, to court and he was sent to jail or sent back to the, to the UK. <coughs> so I think there were many, many faults with the British, but corruption, no. Uh, Mr. Sukas, do you want to comment on this question of imperial yes, legacy? I think I can corruption? say the same for, the, uh, for Northern Rhodesia. Uh, we are very conscious of corruption today, but that was not an issue uh, um, pre-independence. Okay, Mr. Mr. Singh, do you want to comment? No, of course. All right, uh, other questions, please. A question here at the front. The microphone is coming. My name is Satwan Singh. I'm son of a, a, an army, British Army soldier of First World War and Two World Wars. In the First World War, he was a young lad in Afghanistan, then he came down to Karachi, went to Africa. I was only four years old when he went to war again, 39. And um, what I want to say is the legacy of empire the empire has given a system to the world. Uh, they have established a law for everything. Everywhere you go, I mean in Kenya, where I was born, I mean there was a system, there wasn't any corruption, there wasn't, and you were respected. And the way the British has come out of all these colonies and protectorates and all that, they deserve some respect. And if I'm at all, I'm here in England because when they wanted to dump us onto, you don't know, the African government, and they said, we're going to Africanize you, you won't get a job. Your children will have a second class citizenship. They won't be considered as equal to an African. I said, no, I'm going to England. I've come here. Thank God that I'm here. And it's a blessing, I tell you that. So, this British legacy of the empire is a system that's given to you people. Look at India, the caste system, the sati system, killing people each other. You know, you don't see that here now. I've come here, so isn't it a blessing? It is a blessing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for underlining that question of respect. and the ability of the empire to come home, as it were. Um, other questions, please? Uh, for us, depends. Uh, to uh, the middle one, and then uh, Rob, and then another question behind. My name is Alistair Boyd, Royal African Society. Uh, we've had reference uh, this morning to the uh, problems relating to the federation of uh, what was then Nyasaland, Northern Rhodesia, and Southern Rhodesia. It is rather an interesting point to note that none of the federations <clears throat> that were brought into being at the turn of independence or just before have survived. And we look at the Malaysian Federation, and that failed pretty quickly. Look at the attempt in the West Indies, and that failed as well. Central Africa Federation failed, and then we talk about the East African uh, Federation as well. Were these federations, do you think, a sort of a scheme whereby we could unload as the colonial power our colonies into larger economic units, uh, like, and then that would say in the Central Africa Federation absorb uh, Nyasaland, which couldn't stand up on its own. So were these sort of convenient sort of vehicles through which we could, so to speak, get rid of the rest of the empire? Okay, thank you. I'd like to take another question behind, please. And yes, I do know there. And then the third question at the back, please. The lady with the hat. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm John Wilson. I'm a legislative drafter. I've drafted laws in the Caribbean, Hong Kong, uh, Pacific, and Atlantic, but not in, in Africa. 
But the reason I'd like to speak now and ask the panel a question is that I understand from colleagues whom I meet that the statute books are standing up pretty well. It is one of the important legacies of empire, not just the judicial system, but the actual laws that were written and continue to be written. You can see the statute books on the shelves of uh, any of the uh, inns of court libraries and probably here. Uh, do the panel feel that the British laws and the, that the statutory legislative system uh, has worked and is working? My only query is that there are not enough uh, young people learning law drafting, and that is something that in the Commonwealth we are trying to achieve. There is a Commonwealth Association of Drafters, so the lady at the back that asked earlier about the Commonwealth can be reassured it's still alive and kicking in some professional areas. So uh, do the panel feel that that the statute books in their countries do their job. Thank you. I'd like to take one brief question at the back, please. The lady uh, with the hat wearing red. Thank you. And then we'll Thanks. Um, Google to Ogam Selegu from Bebop Productions. I'm a film producer. Um, I'm really quite surprised at um, how everyone in the room and the panel are just sort of praising and saying how wonderful um, the empire or colonialism actually was. But it seems to me that. Um, there's been something that's been overlooked, that is uh, the business, uh, the UK government support, continued support of businesses in Africa, um, apart from the Zambian speaker who actually mentioned what, what happened with the copper mining and um, how farmers, European farmers basically were um, supported over African farmers. But, I mean, isn't it, a, isn't it true that the reason that Africa is still in the state that it's in is because of the continued support of foreign businesses who um, probably um, own most of Africa? Thank you very much. So, three questions then. One on whether federations were a convenient vehicle, in your view. Um, your comment on the statute books that you were bequeathed and also the legacies of exploitative business practices. So, um, Mr. Singh. Uh, well, I, I, was, I happened to be based in uh, Singapore uh, during the whole uh, drama of uh, Malaysia's formation. And uh, first Brunei went out and then Singapore was kicked out. I think there is no hard and fast rule about federalism. It's, it depends upon what the objectives are and whether the, the, a federalism has to have a broad consensus of people who are to be federated. And if there is no broad consensus, uh, there cannot be a, a successful federation because I, I recall that Lee Kuan Yew uh, was uh, crying at a television press conference I attended and everybody asked, I said, you know, how can Lee Kuan Yew cry? So I said, well, he cried because he thought he was so foolish not to see the writing on the wall. So that is as far as federalism goes. As far as uh, the evils of empire, if I might put it that, there have been many. And, and we all know from, from history books that there, there have been aspects of the empire which, uh, which are decidedly ugly. And uh, that's acknowledged by uh, historians, British as well as others. So uh, there's no dispute, I think, on that. Thank you. Dr. Alika. I, the idea of federation uh, was good. And I think the, the intentions were, were good. Unfortunately, uh, the people were not consulted. And in the case of East African Federation, the Baganda were afraid that the uh, white settlers in Kenya would uh, move into Uganda. So the, in the case of, East, uh, of Central Africa, it was just not proper because there were three separate countries uh, the good thing, uh, uh, the, the, reason, the, the way Federation was made, it was very easy for the British to, to administer because they were the colonial power. But once the, gov the governments broke up into separate states, it was no longer possible. That's why Nyerere and Amin did not see eye to eye. Uh, on the issue of the statute books, the law. We have in Uganda and generally in East Africa not changed much of the law that the British left for us. Uh, and many cases have come up and people have got away with it because of 
the, the way the system. And some lawyers are now talking about changing the, the, the law, but there is a lot of resistance from ordinary people because they think that if the law is changed by a particular government, it's because they are trying to get at a particular individual. Thank you. In the, in the case of the Central African Federation, there may have been uh, this element of uh, the British um, government wanting to dump um, the area. But I think the key element in the situation is really that it wasn't just a federation. It was a white-dominated federation. It was not a democratic federation. Africans were um, given a minority share of power in the, in the parliament, and as time went on, even this share was, uh, there was an attempt to, be, to reduce. So I think you have to see it as a political action ra rather than a dumping action. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very conscious that we have to allow enough time uh, for lunch and Philip has also instructed me firmly to keep to time. So I would like to thank our three panelists for their unique observations and emphasizing the, the particular context as Dr. Kwarteng emphasized and picking up on what Dr. Uh, Professor Aye said about the complicated and differentiated legacies um, from empire. But please, if you could join me in a round of applause for our speakers.